Hey everyone, this is Tim, and I am celebrating my two-year anniversary out of Christianity. Around this time in 2019, I left Christianity for very good reasons. And I know some of you have followed my story. Some of you have probably just, just saw my channel and just catching up with where I've been. But I thought I'd give a brief summary of what that journey has been like both up to my deconversion two years ago as well as what it's been like since then. It's been quite an adventure, an adventure I would have never guessed ever in a million years, but I do want to share a few thoughts, and I hope I can share a few encouragements, and also maybe a few, uh, I don't know what the word would be, maybe warnings for people who are just on the beginning stages of their deconversion. It's, it's definitely not easy, and sometimes just knowing what's most likely around the corner can be helpful as you can kind of brace yourself for the impact. But again, my name is Tim Mills. Uh, my channel here is obviously Harmonic Atheist. And uh, harmonic does not refer to the idea that I want to be in harmony with everybody. Uh, harmonics is relating to a couple of things. Uh, the biggest one is relating to trading, uh, trading stocks, uh, currencies, Forex, and so forth. I'm a chartist. I love studying charts, Fibonacci's, you know, measured moves, uh, harmonic patterns, uh, all that stuff. The um, crazy stuff that you see people do. It's, it's pretty amazing when you learn it. And I love it. I study it more and more every month. It feels like uh, learn something new and figure out something better about how to trade. And I just, I love harmonics. Uh, I also have seen increasingly in my study of Christianity that something related to harmonics, the way that Pythagoras would have referred to it is also related to some of the origins of Christianity. So that's becoming part of the story. I uh, didn't intend that originally, but it's an interesting, um, interesting irony. So I grew up as a Christian. I grew up in a Christian home. I trusted Jesus as my savior when I was, I think about five years old. Uh, just said a prayer with my, my older brother. I wanted to trust Jesus as my savior. I knew I was a sinner, wanted to go to heaven, wanted to be right with God. And I believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again for my sins. And that simplicity was very genuine. Uh, my mom told me many times she saw evidence of such a warm and tender heart in me. She would see times where other people in the room would not be very sensitive to um, certain people that were in pain. And I was always sensitive and I was always trying to bring it back to, you know, God, God loves you. God has a plan in this. God is watching you. He's caring about you. And endless stories about that kind of background that I brought to the table, evidence that the gospel, even as a young, young five-year-old was, was blossoming in my heart. Uh, of course, as you do, you get serious uh, about the Lord. You get the, the sermons about this can't just be an inherited faith. This can't be something that you just get from your uh, parents and say, well, they believe, so I do too. You have to decide for yourself. And as much as those kind of sermons are scary to think about in some ways, when you're that you know young person, they're a great uh, reminder to say, you know, I can't just say I believe. I have to actually question, do I really believe? And when you think about what's at stake at that point, you think, that, you know, hell's real. There's a lot at stake. So you really do have a lot of impetus to think through it, to examine your heart, to be sure that you are in the faith and to be sure that you are not in any way going through the motions because um, you have to be right with God. You have to make sure that this is not a, a, a human effort. And so... I had a couple of times when I, uh, more than a couple of times when I've recommitted my life to the Lord to make sure, you know, said, God, if it wasn't real before, you know, please hear my heart. I really do believe that you are the, the God, the creator of this universe, that you are loving uh, the king, you're the judge of all, and that uh, you are perfect and holy, and that you deserve uh, the worship that we uh, should be giving you, and that we unfortunately fell and did not worship you the way we should or honor you or, or love you and obey you. And that, that deserved punishment because your holiness uh, always deserves punishment. Uh, your, or breaking your holiness deserves punishment. And so when you look at verses like, you know, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. There's none who does good, no, not one. Our righteousness is like a filthy rag and on and on it goes. You see that we've fallen short and that God has uh, basically a, a really sad part of the plan for us. And that is if you don't have a way to have your sin issue dealt with, you are going to die. Uh, you're going to die uh, temporarily. You're also going to die eternally. And of course, the, the good news is the other side of that equation that God has said, I've created a provision for you. If you will turn from your sin and to my son, uh, his death and resurrection was 
the, the perfect sacrifice for you. He was the spotless lamb and his death and resurrection was in your stead and you still have to accept it, but there's nothing you can do. You can't bring any good works. You can't bring any, well, I've, I've got a good track record. I didn't murder anybody. I was, I was pretty nice most of the time. Uh, that doesn't work with God. God says your righteousness doesn't make any difference. Your righteousness is completely filthy in my sight. You need someone else who's perfect. And there's only one perfect sacrifice, only one, only one truly spotless lamb. And that is God himself. And God became a man and, and through Jesus. And of course, the whole nativity uh, story, Jesus uh, time on the earth, and then his ultimate uh, death and resurrection through the gospels. And then of course the church uh, began from there. That was my bread and butter. I loved it. Um, I thought deeply about all those issues. As I grew up, uh, I was homeschooled part of the time and I was encouraged to pick some preachers to listen to. I was asked to just listen to a couple, but I did many, many more than a couple. But some of the biggest ones I would listen to were people like John MacArthur, Chuck Swindoll, Alistair Begg, uh, many of the older preachers who were, you know, if you, if you were born in the, in the last 20 years, you just be like, who is that? And if you heard it, you'd think, oh my gosh, is that from the 1800s? But some of the old time uh, preachers uh, from usually from the South, but uh, preachers that just love the Lord, love the word, uh, love Jesus, love the gospel, love the kingdom. And I just, I ate that up. I just wanted to be on fire for the Lord. And certainly mixed in with that was this passion to actually preach the gospel, not just to, to live, enjoy the gospel as, as a recipient of it and to live it for people to see, hey, can you, know, can you see my life? There's a difference, but to actually go tell it to people who are lost. I did a lot of street preaching, street evangelism, uh, a lot of uh, soup kitchen work, endless soup kitchen work, a lot of work in uh, rough neighborhoods around Philadelphia where I grew up, working with uh, people, even drug addicts, um, certainly a lot of people in poverty, going into schools, very dangerous schools, um, and some non, very not dangerous schools, some wonderful schools where it was full of little kids that just needed, needed to be loved on so much. And that was just such a beautiful experience in, uh, around Chester, Pennsylvania. But I had this welling up in me of this, this drive to say, well, we all here in, in the United States have the gospel. We clearly have a Bible. You can pick it up. You may not have had a preacher. You may not have had someone explain it to you, but at least you have a chance. You, you can go to a bookstore. You can go online. You can go somewhere. There wasn't an online at the beginning of this story, obviously, but now you can go and, and pick up a Bible. Um, you, you have full access to it in one sense. And my heart's passion was for the people that had no Bible. There are thousands of people who have a language where they can speak to each other. They're mostly tribal, uh, probably all tribal actually, but tribal people who have spoken to each other for you know thousands of years and they've just never written down an alphabet or if they do, it's, it's extremely primitive. And so they don't really have a way to have books yet. And you'd be surprised how many people are still like that in this, in this day and age. It's, it's crazy to even wrap your mind around that. But when I saw that, and especially with a group that uh, used to be called New Tribes Mission. They're now called Ethnos 360, but they had this video called Etau, which means it is true in a tribal language. And this couple had gone to a tribe in Papua New Guinea and had uh, basically taken a couple of years to learn the language and the culture, really make sure they understood what people were saying and meaning so they didn't make you know huge mistakes and accidentally tell the Jesus story and Judas and find out that Judas is the hero and because in that tribe, you know, people that are... Um, that are the, the backstabbers are, are really the heroes, you know, learning all about their culture, making sure they understood what these people thought. Then they translated the Bible into their language and chronologically taught them to the Old Testament, you know, saying there's only one God, all these other spirits that, that do exist, that you think of, you know, in an animistic context, they do exist. There are spirits, but they're all subservient to God. There's only one God, but he does have a son. And as they paint this picture, um, of the old testament saying you know god demands blood to be dealing with your sin issue your sin will eventually condemn you to hell and that you need uh, some kind of restitution some kind of way to atone for your sin and that eventually when you get to the story of jesus they're like oh we've seen over and over you've talked about the spotless lamb spotless lamb spotless lamb the replacement ram in the bushes with you know abraham and isaac we get it now jesus is that ram stuck in the bushes he is the spotless lamb he, his blood is, is our final sacrifice. And this tribe of like, I think 300 people or so, all of them came to Christ and they just started rejoicing and dancing like Jesus is our savior. And I saw that and I thought, 
that's that's my life right there that's my future i want to go take the gospel to the people that have never heard it and i was in bible college uh, lancaster bible college i did one year at bob jones university uh and then finished up at lancaster bible college and then i uh, did eventually go on to new tribes mission school uh, mission school up in pennsylvania absolutely on fire for the lord just loved thinking about what it would be like to say to someone who was utterly as it were dangling over the flames of hell and you know, sinners in the hands of an angry god and with no no true hope for their future and to say i come here not not as myself offering you anything but as a beggar who knows where to find the bread the bread is in jesus he is the bread of life and let me tell you what it means to believe in him and what that belief in his death and resurrection will do for you that was everything to me the kingdom was everything to me reading what other wonderful pastors and solid theologians and, and uh, Christians had written in, in the past few hundred years and earlier reading about the kingdom of God and uh, just diving deep into, into Calvin and Luther and all these great theologians into Spurgeon, uh, so many great people, uh, certainly even some, some current day people like uh, Dallas Willard and, and others like him, who were just trying to understand the dynamics of what it meant like to, what it meant to live out the kingdom of God that is in one sense coming the future kingdom but also the kingdom is inside of you and to live it out the kingdom is here and now as well and to live out that amazing paradox that christ is in you the mystery of christ is christ is in you and i just i loved jesus i loved the cross i loved his death and resurrection obviously didn't love that he had to die for us but love that he did it loved him for it i uh, loved god as my father for for being willing to sacrifice his own son. What a horrible thing to see your own son dying, but to say, I'm gonna create this plan from eternity past that will in fact create redemption for my people. And in a sense, this this welling up to say, what are the ages to come gonna be like? God is redeeming a people for himself that effectively becomes like his bride. And he's, you know, God's gonna give this bride to Jesus, but it's, he's gonna purify it. And Jesus is gonna have had this wonderful, pure bride, the church, and certainly, you know, the, the true, the true Israel, and they would love Jesus, and then he would give them a new heart, and just to think about what was coming in the future, and, and certainly C.S. Lewis was wrapped up in that, where, you know, God's going to make it so that when this, the culmination of the ages happens, and you think it's finally here, the kingdom of God is finally in front of me, I can see it now, it's not just in my faith, in my book, it's, it's in front of me, that what you thought of as the final chapter is actually the first chapter and it'll be amazing in and of itself it's the first chapter of many chapters and every chapter just gets infinitely better than the last blows your mind and i worked hard at that point to deal with my strong desire to say what what am i missing here about god in terms of my worldview and so one of the biggest things that came up at that point was i was working on a prayer book uh, where I was just saying, I really want to have a prayer life. That's really, it's not just like, God, you know, help me to have a good day. Help me to love you. Help me to share your word. Same thing as always, you know, I said this prayer a hundred times. I say it every day. I'm like, I want to be on fire for the Lord. And it's like, if this is a conversation, then the way you would do a conversation is you would learn something about somebody and talk about it. You know, if you're learning, meeting someone at a coffee shop, you talk about their day, you talk about their experience, whatever story they want to tell you what they're going through you learn about them and you, you kind of interact with it and so i thought what a what a great way to take what i'm learning about god from pastors and books from these great authors from these great preachers and when they when there's some point that they make this just stellar like whoa i need to go back to that highlight that i want to go back to it and turn it back into a prayer and say god you are doing this you are the ultimate artist you are the amazing mathematician behind it all you are the designer um, par excellence you are everything you are the, the father the abba and just to begin to pray pray to pray to god what he's revealed so you're not just like reading it third person and like oh this is a textbook i want to have it you know uh, cataloged chloroformed um everything is just right in the right spot like no no I'm, I'm not here to learn a theology i'm here to enjoy and delight and love a person who's existed for all eternity and has brought me into existence now and has said, I want to love you. And I did, I went to the ends of the earth, so to speak, and back. I did everything I needed to and could to redeem you and you are mine. And for me to say, God, thank you. I love you. I love you back. I wanted to 
redeem my worldview. I wanted to say, God, show me where there's there's the the dark shadows of the sin nature and that's in me and the the selfishness, the worldliness. Eradicate not just the sin, but but even the thoughts that aren't thinking. Like I want to think your thoughts after you, God. You think a thought, I want to mimic it. What are you thinking about? I want to do that. What are you feeling? I want to feel it. I want to think and feel your thoughts and emotions after you, God. I love you. You know, you are my all in all. And you, there is nothing else that could consume me more than to have my mind aligned to the truest reality. And the world did seem like, like a, just a shadow land, as, as they would say, as I think C.S. Lewis said, where this, this world is just like a, it's almost like a fake um, hologram or just a shadow of, of what's the reality. And so you don't want to focus on what's here, what's, what's present, what's temporary. You want to focus. I mean, yes, you have to be present. You have to love the people around you and go to work and do your job and pay the bills and bring, bring home food. But that's not the biggest picture. This is, is partially a testing ground, uh, but it's also a way to get you ready for the, the, biggest, the biggest reality that's coming. And the biggest reality that's coming is what happens after you die. And that is you face a judgment seat you know, you, you go to heaven or you go to hell and then the true life begins and the truest understanding of God begins and your truest ability to be Christ-like begins. You, you now are like a, a, a very dirty mirror that's trying to reflect the light. And, you know, there's so much dirt on you that you're reflecting some, but you're, you're not reflecting much. The idea that God is going to absolutely make your, your, the mirror of your heart perfectly clean someday so that when God shines his light on you, you shine and you just reflect the, the love and the light and the truth of Christ. And to be an empty vessel to say, God, I want to get rid of my sins. I want to be an empty vessel, like an empty pipe that has no, no, it, nothing that inhibits your spirit from just flowing through me. I want to be a vessel. I want to shine. I do not want to be on the fence. I do not want to be a casual Christian. Please do not spew me out of your mouth. I do not want to be lukewarm. I want to love Jesus and make a difference for the world. I want to take as many people as I can into the kingdom. And for those who do not come into the kingdom, I at least want to be faithful to the calling to tell people there is a savior. His name is Jesus and his death and resurrection is the only way to God. That was my life. That was my everything. I was also working on a worldview book now that I think about it, uh, a book that was not a prayer book, but just a book about worldview. It was the idea that if you really reject evolution, you said evolution is not reality in any way, shape, or form. There's no randomness. This God is the designer. There's a design. When you look at everything, you can't deny the design behind everything. And you also can't deny the, uh, you know, the fact that it's, it's in everything. You see, you know, the way a seashell expands and you see the universe expanding that way. You see all these things, you know, even the Fibonacci sequence with that uh, same, same concept, but you see all these designs, you see the math, the science. And it was like, God, if you're this clever, you're this amazing, you're this brilliant, you've put all these kind of hints of yourself all over the universe, then there is a sense in which it's probably accurate to say that absolutely nothing is random in the sense of your original design. So if you designed birds to work a certain way, there's something about either your nature or the gospel or a future in heaven that that reflects. And I need to think about it and dwell on it and kind of take the lessons, not just character lessons, but to say, what is it, what is it about this that, that shines kind of like it talks about how all of creation is, you know, rejoicing um, when you, you just, you know, the stars are shouting, everything is saying, God, 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 you did this. You're amazing. And all, you know, the nature in a sense that it isn't tainted by sin, but just it's part of the original design that's there. And maybe we, we see it dimly, but the, the, the pattern is still there. Um, it's all shining and saying, God, God, glory to God. You know, even the, just like the tree is rustling. It's like a way of the tree leaves singing to Jesus saying, Jesus, we're singing to you. Uh, even the brilliance of a storm, you know, the deference to God's power. All these ways in which I wanted to say, God, I want to, to, to be less random in my thoughts and more open to seeing your patterns of your nature and the gospel and our future in heaven with you in this present world. I want to truly be um, heavenly minded enough that when, when I look at my earthly mind, my earthly mind is so well informed about the next life that I'm truly able to be as effective as possible. 
for you. I want to be your servant. I want to be your, your, your faithful servant. You can, at the end of it, I can say, you know, God, I did serve you. Uh, I did it through your power. I didn't do it in my own flesh. It was anything good in me is because of you. I give all glory to you. And for him to say, yes, you did well, well done. You did put yourself aside and let me work through you. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And of course that translated into the desire for marriage, to have a marriage that glorified God. Uh, wrote a book about that. Um, a book that I've at this point, uh, not proud of at all, but a book about my, my search for a wife. Uh, what I was offering as a husband, it was a Christian husband, and what I was looking for in a Christian home, Christian wife, uh, raising kids together to love the Lord. And that did translate into my getting married. And of course, then the next stage is if, you know, God provides kids, you want to raise them to love the Lord and to just, just be absolutely fully aware that God's love was permeating our home and their lives, that God's love was there and that, you know, you pray and hope and uh, just wish so much that their eyes would be opened to see that the, the beauty of the gospel and to see their need for Jesus. And so as you do, you sing songs, you read verses, you know, you tell them, Jesus tells me this, I know. And that was such a beautiful part of, of life. And, you know, singing from the hymnals, making up some songs, but a lot of the traditional songs for kids, uh, reading, you know, stories, talking about all these issues, just how much Jesus was there uh, watching and loving us. He was part of our home. Every, every meal began with a prayer. Uh, every way which we could, we wanted Jesus to be part of our home. That was up to about three and a half years ago, three and a half to four years ago. And this is where it kind of goes from my talking generically as I've been doing to a very specific story. We're sitting there in the living room singing a song called Joshua Fought the Battle of Jericho. If you're not familiar with it, it just goes, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. And it goes on and on. The story, of course, is in the Bible, that, that uh, as God had promised the Israelites, uh, the ancient Israelites, this land that was currently inhabited by pagans, that he said, this is going to be your land. I'm giving it to you. I'm taking it away from them. And you are going to go in and, and take over. This is going to be your promised possession. And in that story, of course, they start with uh, Jericho walking around it seven times. The cool story, you know, if you remember Josh and the big wall with veggie tails and the little cute little peas, you know, it seems like a cool little story and it certainly shines God's glory. You know, God, God made them do it his way. It wasn't just like, go up there get out your swords and you start fighting. It was like God saying, I'm, I'm going to have you involved, but I'm going to make it clear that this is my work, not yours. So your job is not to fight. Your job is to walk around seven days and then walk around seven times at the end, blow your trumpets and the walls will come down. And then this whole process will begin. You will enter the land by this first conquest. And as I was sitting there, we're singing. And of course, the kids are just having a blast. They're, they're spinning and spinning and spinning. Totally delighting in it. I mean, it was just, it was such a fun part of life. For the first time in my life ever, I thought to myself, I know what happens next in this story. The song doesn't talk about it, of course, but in, this, in the bigger picture of the story, they do go into the land, they do conquer, of course, they start with Jericho, but they go into other cities, and it talks about how they slaughter everyone. Not in every, every exact story, but in many of the stories, God says, I don't want anything left alive, not even the animals. You can't even keep the sheep for yourself or the goats or the chickens. I want anything that has ever breathed in that town to die everything. And there's other verses where it says, God says something similar, but he says, yes, everything must die. But if you find young girls who are virgins, you can keep them alive. Hmm. So let, let that hit you for a second. God says, kill everybody, little babies, 
And of course, the the thought you're always given apologetically, apologetics just means a defense of the faith, but apologetically, the, the defense is given as if they didn't kill him, they would have grown up to be pagans who would have tempted the Israelites to worship other gods. God, there was no choice, really. God said it. And the reason he said it was for his to preserve their holiness, to keep them pure, at least to give them a chance to, to be pure. They certainly had the choice. It was up to them in one sense, but God was going to make a path for them to be a people that were wholly dedicated to Yahweh. And things would be under the ban that were not of Yahweh. And it hit me like a, like a tsunami for the first time. And I'm just sitting there. And at this point, I had not done almost any work, like all the work. If you, if you know my story, if you've watched my videos, you know there's a lot more that comes. I hadn't done almost anything like that ever. I didn't have a reason to. I, I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that the Bible was the word of God and it was true. And it just began this really weird situation where I, did, I wasn't. If you would have said to me, be careful, this will lead you to deconvert, I would have said, no, that's, that's not what's happening here. I definitely feel confused and I need to figure out how to explain this and how to understand it. But deconversion means like, you're talking about like atheism. And I didn't have that thought at the time to saying if, if someone had said to me, that's where this is going, I would have said, that's ridiculous. Um, you know, thanks for playing, but that's not what's happening. We're not going towards atheism. We're not certainly not going towards deconversion. Jesus is, is, is real. I know he's real. He lives inside my heart. I've seen his, his power. All these things. I know he's real. Fulfilled prophecies, the beauty of the Bible. You know, what, what is your hope if you're, if you're godless? That's the kind of things I would have said. You know, why is there something rather than nothing? What about all this beautiful design? There has to be a God. And clearly, the Bible is the best explanation for, for all that. And it just sat. It sat and sat and festered. And I remember saying to some loved ones at that point, like, I just said, look, I, I just want to be honest. You know, I feel like, you know, in close relationships, we need to be open about where we're at with things, you know, you don't just say every last thing that's on your mind all the time, but you do need to be open about big changes that are happening to you. And I said, honestly, I don't know where to, what to think about where I'm going with all this, but I feel uncomfortable in some ways defending these stories. And I just put it out there as this way. I said, I am realizing the importance of saying the words, I'm more committed to the truth than to the Bible. And meaning hopefully they're the same, but that if, if I discover something that's going to unravel my previous worldview, I'm willing to go where the truth sends me, not just say, well, I'm just going to, you know, put my fingers in my ears and say, la, 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 and go my merry way and just bury my head in the sand. I, I want to be someone that's intellectually honest and honest with the issues. And the backlash I got from that was, whoa, off the charts. Like, what in the world are you talking about? How can you pursue the truth more than the Bible or than Christianity? You can't pursue the truth. That The Bible is truth. That's just, that's a nonsense statement. And so I kind of had to keep my thoughts to myself. It was like, well, I guess it's not safe to talk about it. And so it began. Little did I know. Little did I know. So it began and I began to dig and I didn't have, I didn't have a plan. I wasn't like, I think I need to go dig into this and that topic. I just began to dig. It certainly started with issues of the genocide concepts, uh, but I began to kind of mentally list out like in more detail, what are the concerns here? Like, what are you really saying? Like, what is your, what is your angst about? Started of course with genocide. And I said, well, if, if this wasn't of God, then this is, genocide it's also land theft they're stealing people's land that have been there for maybe hundreds or thousands of years certainly this is tribalism or a version of racism they're saying we're we're better god loves us he, he's willing to slaughter you to get you out of here permanently out of here um endless endless violence brutality the circumcision thing became became more bizarre 
Like, why would, why would God say you're born perfect? You know, this male baby, but whatever it is, eight days later, I need you parents to cut off into this penis. That's genital mutilation. Like why? And if, if, if God had said to do it to girls too, would we have done it to girls? Like, what are we just used to this? And, you know, when you certainly, when you have boys, but I've got two boys and two girls, but when you have boys, it makes you think about it. And fortunately we did not circumcise our boys. I'm very grateful for that. Uh, but you have a lot of questions that come up. Like, why would, why would God do that? Does this make sense? Where did that come from? And that, that question of where did it come from? I would say that's the biggest turning point in my deconversion story is, is starting to ask the question, where did this come from? And if those of you who've been down this path, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you start to say, I wonder how this story got the way it got here. Was there another iteration of this story earlier? Did it change? Did they copy it from someone else? And the, the moment that you start to open, entertain that thought and say, maybe, just maybe, this story came from some other venue or evolved in some way. Maybe there was an earlier story, you know, for case in point, Gilgamesh and, and Noah. You start to add that into the equation, even a, just a fraction of a fraction, it begins to open a crack in your worldview. And that's what this is all about, is, is cracks that get larger, cracks in the dam that get larger. And so as I began to think through the issues, especially the, after the genocide and land theft stuff, I got into really thinking through what they were doing with these virgins, thinking, okay, why, why does it say you keep the virgins? I mean, yeah, it's great that they're keeping someone alive, but you know, why are they killing anybody? Why are they not letting the young boys? I mean, yeah, if they have to kill the warriors, you know, maybe back then they turned boys into warriors at 14 or 15, but, you know, six-year-old boys, two-year-old boys, should they be slaughtered? You know, the angst of that. Babies, baby boys that have just been, you know, that are nursing at the breast, they're only two days old, should they be slaughtered? And you think about these girls and you think, this, the, what would, you have to mentally put yourself in the, in the frame of mind of what would these people have been like? What would their experience have been like? You think, so these girls would have literally seen savage men come into their home, slaughter their parents, slaughter their brothers, slaughter the babies, slaughter the grandmas, granddads, slaughter the animals, kill their favorite dog, all that stuff. You know, burn the place down, probably. Throw everything in the river or whatever. And then the girls, the young girls that are virgins uh, that weren't probably you know, baby, you know, young, young girls, but girls that are like, you know, preteens, whatever age they would have considered eligible for, to consider being matched for marriage at that point, but still virgins. These girls are probably like all grouped together. So if it was a village of, you know, a thousand people, you know, what would you have a couple dozen young girls left? You think these young girls that are just in shock, I mean, sh probably shaking, shaking internally, bawling their eyes out. They've lost everything everyone they know, except for a few friends around them. And they're all probably tied up with rope. And all these savage men with these, you know, blood-stained swords. And they find out somehow that their purpose at this point is to go live with their slaughterers the parent, the slaughters of their parents and siblings to go live with them and to become one of the men's wives. And so these young girls who are just starting to, starting to live, starting to blossom in life, they lost everything that they loved and they suddenly have to become basically the breeding ground for another culture. Child brides is a form of rape. And as this hit me more and more and more, I thought, this just doesn't sound right. 
And that's another phrase I want to encourage you to think through. If something doesn't sound right, say that to yourself. It just doesn't sound right. Something's off here. It takes guts to say it sometimes, depending on the topic and how far you are in that conversation. But give yourself the freedom and the bravery to say, this doesn't sound right. And I'm not going to override it just because some apologist has a quick answer for me. Oh, well, God's holiness required it. And well, if, you know, if they didn't, if they didn't become child brides, they would have been slaughtered. So pick your poison. Which one would you rather, would you rather they be lying in a, you know, in a pit in their own blood, gasping for breath and dying? Or would you rather they be, have a chance at life and a chance to follow, learn about the true God, Yahweh? Isn't that better than them being slaughtered? The apologist's answers, shiny as they may be for certain topics on the surface, their answers begin to fade and they become irrelevant. They become foolish and they basically talk themselves out of a job. And they become exposed as charlatans and as people that aren't worth listening to. Another topic that came up pretty quickly was slavery. The Bible talks about how you can have slaves. You can bequeath them to your children because they're your property. You can beat them. It says if you beat your slave and as long as they get up off the ground within two days, you don't get any kind of punishment as the slave owner. You only get punished if you beat them and after two days or more, they, they die. The issue of uh, tricking slaves where if you have, if you buy a male slave and say this such situation is such that that slave owes you a debt where they have to be your slave hand and foot for five years, but they're of marriageable age. And so you, you go buy them a female slave so they can be married. That female slave is also yours, but they're now married and you have a, you know, whatever, a little side house where they begin their marriage life as your slaves. And they have kids together, obviously. And when the five years is up, your male slave can go free because they're paid off, but you don't send the female with them. The female and the children are yours. So you're effectively tricking that male slave into becoming your slave forever. And this is part of God's prescription. God never says, ever says, don't own people. Just don't, don't own people. It's not, not correct. That translates, of course, into many other topics, uh, certainly misogyny and patriarchy. I know as a Christian, patriarchy and you know, feminism was vilified. Like That's devil's talk. Of course, God wants men in charge. But as you begin to think through it, you begin to step away from the edge of the party line. You begin to think, wait a second, wait a second. This doesn't sound right. As you let these things sit. And then you, you eventually become just a little bit more educated into how to investigate the claims. You begin to find places where you can read research articles. You find different books that have already been out there. Some of them have been out there for a century. Some of them are brand new, but people talking about these issues all over the board, giving you insights. And you begin to learn stuff that you never knew before. You find out that there weren't four gospels. There was like 50 or more. You find out that the four we have in the New Testament canon, we don't know who wrote them. They weren't Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You find out there wasn't one book of Acts. There's at least six. You find out that there are many, many epistles, many of them written in the names of Paul and Peter and so forth. But from what we understand of textual criticism, the best minds out there say many of these books were forgeries. And then they say some of the books in the New Testament that claim to be from Paul, such as you know Timothy's, they were probably not written by Paul at all. They're probably written much later by people who just claimed to be writing for Paul or in Paul's name. And so you question yourself more and more. You say, well, how do I know that the books that are in there were supposed to be? And how do I know that there weren't other books that were kicked out that could have been in there or that maybe were in there for a while and got kicked out like Enoch? And it just, the questions began to arise and you begin to realize you can't put these things to bed quickly. This is a big, big, big research project. This is a big issue. It shocks your system as to why people haven't been already like, why, why did I go to Bible college and mission school? And I'm not already well informed about these issues, but you realize they Christians don't talk about it. You won't hear this stuff in church and on and on it goes. And eventually 
one of the biggest breakdowns for me was once I realized the origins of the Yahweh character, that the, the Yahweh character, the, what we call the Lord, uh, he, capital L-O-R-D, he was originally not the main God. He was originally the son of Elyon and Asherah, and that they had many children, uh, such as Baal and all that, who were competitors local regional competitors and that Yahweh was like a storm God and that the story evolved and eventually obviously the Yahweh character began to take over the story. He eventually became merged with Elyon and so it was Yahweh and his Asherah and eventually they removed Asherah probably because they didn't want a female in the Godhead. They wanted it to be very patriarchal. So it was a male God and only male God, only ever male God. He had a son how did he have a son with no wife? But he had a son and he had the Holy Spirit, which was originally described in very feminine terms and was now being described in either masculine terms or, or in neuter terms. All these issues with the character of Yahweh earlier, but then the origins of Yahweh, realizing some of this stuff went back very clearly to Egypt, such as uh, the pork taboo, circumcision, blood magic. And it, as you dive deeper into this, what happens is you begin to, to see what you used to believe with a completely, you know, believing perspective and just say, I totally buy into this. Of course, this is truth. It begins to sound strange. Even the, the things that you would have said, this is what I love about church, about going to church, about Jesus, about talking to Jesus, about singing songs, worship songs to our Lord. Things like eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Like, the more that I say that to myself, the more it sounds strange. The mystery cults was another big hurdle. Um, really diving deep into understanding the mystery cults. I highly, highly recommend you dive into that. Realizing how many mystery cults were out there, how many of them had so many dynamics that were very similar to what Christianity eventually uh, you know, borrowed, so to speak. You can't always say it was uh, it was a clear borrowing or copying. Sometimes it was just it was just the milieu. Everybody was doing this. So, but in many cases, it was a copy. Realizing for many of these stories that they were literally the Jesus stories were, were literally copying from other gods. And of course, you know, apologetics comes along, and apologists will say that looks like it's true on the surface, but when you look deeper, the details it falls apart. It wasn't a copy. And so it's easy to write it off and think there's not much here. I mean, you can look up videos in, in 30 seconds, I'm sure, on YouTube that say, you know, the Dionysius Jesus parallels are not really that firm. The, Di the, the Mithras parallels are not there. Um, the Serapis, whatever, on and on it goes. Parallels with, you know, the, the mother goddesses to Mary, they're not there. And it's so easy if you're not prepared to really do the hard work to just say, oh, you know, this is what the silly atheists use is their reason to that they want to sin. They don't want bow the knee to God. So this is their, their mental gymnastics they come up with, but we have a good answer. But you do just a little bit of digging, just a little bit. It doesn't even take that much. And you find out the apologists are telling you a fraction of the story, a small fraction. And once you realize it, it doesn't just open your eyes to that specific issue or topic you're studying. It brings up the question of why are they telling me so little about this whole picture? Why are they telling me this little slice of it? Tell me the whole thing. And you begin to distrust them more and more and more because you're like, this is your story doesn't sound right, but it also isn't, isn't right the way you're treating these topics. You sound like you want to control the narrative. You sound like you want to say, we can't have it as an option that the gospel is copied from this God or that God. So we have, it's like, it's, it's already our conclusion. We know Jesus didn't copy it. Therefore, we have to make, make a way to make it look like he didn't copy. As you get deeper and deeper, you, it just falls apart over and over and over. You realize there is a lot. It's endless, the copies. What took it well over the finish line was uh, certainly realizing specific copies where they're actually like, there's no doubt about it. Uh, some of them with Dionysius with, I mean, G Dionysius, uh, we know turned water into wine. 
So Jesus turning water into wine in the first miracle is kind of a clue, but there's a lot of other stuff that's woven in. Um, things like, you know, riding a donkey into the city, ding, 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 that's Dionysius. Um, but even things relating to stories in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, and certainly uh, perhaps more poignantly, the Bacchae, Euripides Bacchae, you see stories where the Jesus character is doing things similar to Dionysius. In some cases, it's copying what some of the Greek poets wrote word for word. And in other cases, uh, there's copies from other parts of the same story where it's not Dionysius, but it's, for example, Odysseus. Um, so you find out, uh, and this carries on not just through the Jesus stories, but even through Paul, where um, you remember Paul resurrected Eutychus. Uh, it, it looks very, very, very similar to Odyssey's fate of Elpinor, where uh, Elpinor was a character that had died and was resurrected. Um, very, very similar dynamics and even some of these stories you begin to realize that they're they're changing the way that they talk like they're doing first person first person first person then it switches to third person right there at that juncture in the story and the jesus stories do this or paul stories do the same thing it changes to third person right there in this that part of the story like it certainly could be coincidence but when you add it up it's it's like this one could be coincidence this one could be coincidence any one of them, you could look at anything and say, there's a lot of coincidences that happen in life. You know, you can't just, you know, if you're looking for patterns, you're going to find them. You can't look at this and say, well, parallelomania stuff, it's all over the place. You have to, you, you're, 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 yes, there's, there's coincidence, but that's not enough. There has to be something more. But what happens is it becomes, it becomes eventually so prevalent that you can't deny it. And to deny it would be intellectually dishonest. You're like, okay, um, you know, Paul's resurrection of Eutychus based on Odyssey's Elpinor. Um, you see certainly Mary's washing of Jesus's feet being a rewrite of Eurekalia's washing Odysseus's feet in the Odyssey, even to the point where they're, they're, they're using the same words several times. Visions of Peter and Cornelius are based on the story of Iliad's Ag Agamemnon. Uh, Paul's farewell at Miletus based on Hector's far farewell to Andromache. Uh, the Lottery of Matthias, based on details from the Lottery of Ajax. Uh, that's the Lottery of Matthias in, in Acts, the beginning of Acts. Uh, Paul's escape from prison borrows details from Priam's escape from Achilles. Uh, you find out that there's connections beyond that, too, with um, the Zacchaeus Bacchaeus connection, you know, Zacchaeus in a tree and the Bacchaeus story, uh, or Bacchae. The connection between the two Marys and the two Sophias at the foot of the cross. Uh, if you haven't dove into the two Sophias, it's fascinating stuff. You know, what are the, what are the chances that there's two Marys at the foot of the cross? It, certainly it could have been coincidence. You know, maybe there's just a lot of Marys in Jerusalem at that time. But the fact that there's two Sophias and they're borrowing from so many other things, uh, it begins, you begin to realize what you thought of originally as probably coincidence becomes probably not coincidence pretty quickly. Um, the connection between Plato's Timaeus and the Gospels Bar Timaeus, or Son of Timaeus, Jesus healing the blind man. How the Gamaliel character is quoting uh, the Theresius character, again, in these Greek epics. Uh, how the Paul and Peter stories often mirror and quote from the Pentheus stories. You get into Pythagoras with the 153 fish in John 21. Uh, the other parts of some of the magic numbers going on in uh, the Lewis Luke 2 with Anna in the temple and certainly all over book of Revelation and some other parts of it. You get into some other kind of one-off questions like the order of the books, realizing Paul wrote first, the gospels came later. So, okay, well, if Paul wrote first, why does he never mention Joseph, Mary, the virgin birth, Bethlehem, John, the Baptist, Jesus' miracles, Jesus' parables, Pontius Pilate, you know, Mary Magdalene. Why isn't he talking about some of these just critical pieces of the story, just ignoring them? Well, if, if he came first, it makes sense. Maybe they weren't part of the story yet. Uh, certainly at that point, you get into issues like, you know, why there are nine different endings to the gospel of Mark. Why doesn't Mark have any appearances by Jesus post-resurrection? Kind of implies that Jesus rose again, but there's no appearance to confirm it. And, and the whole idea of, you know, M Matthew and, and Luke copying so extensively from Mark uh, clearly, and then John having so much from Philo in it, and Pythagoras, uh, Luke having so much from Plutarch, if you haven't dove into that, that's a fascinating study, 
Luke and Axe copying so much from Plutarch. It just, you like the wow factor goes off the charts. Like, whoa, 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 what am I learning? And then of course, one of the biggest ones, which I, I really hope to do a big project on someday, realizing uh, that the gospel of Mark is structured in the order of the Zodiac in the right order of the constellations. And it just, it begins to blow your mind and you think, what in the world? What have I been in? And then one of the biggest ones was realizing there's endless copies from other intertestamental books. Uh, the New Testament quotes and plagiarizes from the much older book of Enoch a uh, hundred times. It quotes from many of the other pseudepigraphical, uh, deuterocanonical books hundreds of times, including the Wisdom of Solomon, uh, Sirach or Ecclesiasticus, Baruch, Esdras, Jubilees, Tobeth, uh, Judith, Tobit, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, the Assumption of Moses, the Life of Adam and Eve, the Apocalypse of Zephaniah, on and on it goes. And then you find out Jesus is often quoting from uh, Plato and Socrates and Aristotle, and you're just like, it goes on and on and on. And every time I kind of think, I think I've kind of exhausted the list of things that I need to really study and dive into to, to understand how this came about. Something else comes up. Uh, gematria or numerology, you know, the Jewish numerology, they were huge into that. It's related in part to Pythagoras, but not not a one for one. It just the rabbit hole gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And as I began, I, of course, I didn't know all of these stories at that point. I've studied it in depth since then. And I will be doing so to work on these projects to help other people to escape. But whatever quantity I had at that point, there was a day sitting right in front of this very computer, about two years ago exactly, around the beginning of October 2021. And it just hit me. It hit me like someone strapped me down in front of a fire hydrant. And I was like, I was talking to myself, so to speak, and I was saying, is this real? Like, is Jesus real? And the thought occurred to me, there's just no way. If it was not real, the truth would have come out by now. There's just no way. And there's no way it would have gotten this big if it was based on lies. Is it even possible? Could the planet have been duped for 2,000 years? And of course, you're like shrugging off like, nah, that's, that's not possible. And you begin to think about the culture in which this evolved. The culture where there was, of course, no internet. There was no, not even newspapers for, for the most part, probably. These were, these were people living in tribal locations in the desert, um, in, in primitive, you know, uh, Bronze Age towns or whatever era it was. No way to verify stuff if someone said, oh, Jesus appeared to 500 people. When, when did he do that? Well, it was 50 years ago. They're all dead already. But he did it. We'll name them. Well, no, it's just it's 500 people. Can I talk to them? No, they're already dead. It's, it was a long time ago. But he did it. You have to believe. You have to. Or we're, we're not going to trade with you. You're not going to be able to get your food for your family. You have to believe this is what we're doing as a, as a city. We're believing in Jesus. You get that dynamic. And then you go grow it all the way to Constantine, where Constantine says, you know, I'm going to believe in other gods too, but I'm going to make state religion Jesus. You will believe in Jesus, and we're going to take over your temples. We're going to take your gold out of your pagan temples and give it to the Christians to make their temples better. This is, this is the law now. This is the actual Roman law. Of course, the Catholic Church, you know, we, we know some of that story grows in power and power and power. Always men, men deciding which books go in the Bible, men deciding which books were in the Bible that get taken back out, men arguing over what the verses meant over Jesus's divinity and, you know, hypostatic union stuff, all this crazy stuff, men, 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 men in power. And the more you dig into it, the more you realize, yeah, I can see how this could have happened. Easily, it could have happened as just people telling stories that became a bigger and bigger and bigger deal. It became monolithic. It became institutionalized. And it, it shakes you to your core. Like, oh my goodness, this isn't real. And once you say it a few times to yourself, you're like, 
I can see more than I thought before. I can see it makes more sense, this, that. They were highly influenced by Greek philosophy, highly influenced by these other pagan religions. I mean, Jew the Jewish religion was always syncretizing. They're taking stuff from Babylon, from, you know, from all the, from Zoroastrianism, from the Greeks, from the Romans. They're always taking things and merging them. They were polytheistic well into past Christianity. They were still worshiping Asherah in parts of Israel. And like these people made this up. These early Christians made this up. And we got suckered into it. And it was all to them about this idea of there's a coming kingdom and we want to be part of it. And the angels are coming, you know, read the book of Enoch. The angels are coming. They're going to fight and we're going to be pure and fight with them and take over. We're going to restore all the things that have been broken down that have not obeyed Yahweh. We got suckered into basically people who are apocalyptic saying the end times are coming. A fight is coming. The angels are coming. God's going to restore this. And it all evolved from ancient Canaanite mythology, which evolved from ancient Egyptian and Mesopotamian mythology. And you realize this isn't a 2000 year old lie. This is like a 6,000 year old lie or more. It just keeps evolving. And that Christians today have absolutely no scope for the imagination to understand the chance of this having been from all these human stories that evolved is off the charts. And the chance that this is divine is absolutely, you know, next is zero. There's nothing divine about this. This doesn't look real. It looks like it's just mythology and legend that got bigger and bigger and bigger. And so two years ago, I sat here and the floodgates opened. The dam came crashing down. I described to people as like, if there was a string of dominoes set up, you know, you can tip over. I'd been a mile away when this started 18 months earlier, while taking little baby steps, but eventually the baby steps add up and you you're eventually don't realize it, but you're right in front of the first domino of your true worldview. And you take one little kick and you think it's just a little kick because it's been the same as these other little kicks. And you kick it and it all falls down. Thousand, million dominoes fall. And you can't put them back up. And within that hour, I was fully out. I was fully immediately deconverted within that hour. I couldn't unsee what I'd seen. There was no way to explain it and say, well, God used all the, you know, God was, there was a reason God wanted all this Dionysia stuff woven in. There's a reason he wanted the Mithra stuff woven in. There's a reason he wanted all these other pagan mystery cults to be woven in. There's a reason he had to slaughter all these people and take child brides and genocide, blah, blah, blah. It's just, it all faded. There was no way to explain it anymore. It was dead in the water, completely dead in the water. I obviously began to do some deeper digging and I've got a lot more digging that I want to do. Uh, got a huge collection of books now that I want to read. I could go on and on about what I'm going to be doing projects on. Some of you have heard a lot enough to know, so I won't rehash that for this one, but there's a lot coming. My goal with doing that is, is partially to learn more. Obviously, I love to learn. This was my life. I want to know like Stockholm Syndrome, who was my captor? But I also understand that for a lot of people, this is very daunting. If you tell someone you really need to understand ancient Egypt, ancient Mesopotamia, early Canaanite mythology, uh, Babylonian mythology, you know, Zoroastrianism, the origins, you know, all the other, you know, the, the Canaanite god pantheon, you know, Baal and all this, Elion and Asherah, you need to understand all these things in great detail. You need to understand what happened in the second temple Judaism period. You need to understand how all these stories, where their influences were. You need to understand what the Greeks did to the Jews in terms of what their worldview was like and they, as they mixed it. You need to understand what was happening at, at Alexandria, Egypt. All these stories, you need to understand Plutarch, Philo, Josephus, Pythagoras, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle. You need to read Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. You know, you need to read Euripides, Bacchae, Virgil. People are like, what? Some of it, they're like, what are you talking about? What in the world does Homer's Iliad and Odyssey have to do with Christianity? And you wish you could tell them real quickly. You're like, it has everything to do with it. And you just don't know it yet. 
And of course, to some people be like, that's so fringe. You might as well tell me the moon landing was faked. But once you dig into it, like pull back the layers, talk to, to you know, honest scholars who know Homer inside and out. And then you go into it, you read Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. You watch the movies, you read different translations of it. You get familiar with it. You're like, oh shoot, I can see it. I can see what happened in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. And I can see how they, they framed it the same way. Same thing with Euripides Bacchae. And it, you begin to have eyes to see and you're like, oh shoot. And especially when you see the real copies where it's like these exact words were copied. The, the chance of it being a coincidence drops to zero. They syncretized the hell out of this book. And there are a lot more books that we didn't get. A lot more. You know, why, why didn't they tell us that? If, you, if it quotes the book of Enoch, the New Testament quotes the book of Enoch a hundred times, you should have told me that in church. You should have told me that. But you didn't. My goal, because that is a whole boatload of information and people you know people are raising kids they're doing their jobs they got you know stuff to do they got health concerns like i don't want to how am i going to dive into all that stuff and my goal along with some really amazing people um partners so to speak in in certain ways like uh, derek lambert at myth vision uh, jason folks at dragon's genesis and several other people that are doing a fantastic job my goal is to begin to create projects where for people that have never heard of this stuff or maybe have heard it enough now, but they're like, I still don't know where to start. How do I, how do I do this? The goal is to put it on a silver platter, make it really easy, make it for some of the, just as it's stage one that you could watch a couple of videos and walk away and say, I get it. I see what they did. I see how they made this book. That's, it's obvious that they quoted from Enoch a hundred times. It's obvious that they're quoting from Jubilees and the wisdom of Solomon all over the place. It's obvious that they're copying from the Iliad and the Odyssey, crystal clear. To begin to equip people to defend their lack of faith, so to speak, to give a reason for the lack of Christian hope that is in them. My goal, in addition to that, I'll just add this while I'm talking about goals. My goal is to really, at the same time, create a platform to say, this is not about information only. It is uh, information is going to make a huge difference for a lot of people. For some people, it will make less of a difference. They'll need to think through issues like why is God letting 10,000 kids die of starvation a day? Why are there two-year-olds dying of cancer in the hospital this afternoon? Those issues, they're just like, oh, that doesn't make sense. Some people it'll be hell. Like, why would God say you didn't believe in me? So I'm going to burn you forever. Why can't just God say, I forgive you or give you a second chance? Why isn't, why is the God of second chances a God who never gives you a second chance? All these issues, but I think in the midst of that, as whatever path you take or paths you take to start your deconstruction, deconversion, when you actually escape, when you escape the Bible prison and get out, you realize, number one, Christians will despise you and treat you like a traitor. Even this very week, an issue came up where uh, a loved one was talking about kids and saying, kids christian you know these christian kids they need to be taught the bible and the kids need to respond back and repeat it and so like you know if you take the kids to church or, or in a homeschooling situation the kids are taught a bible story they need to regurgitate it um, they need to be able to summarize it back they need to say it back what happened in the story i told you the story i read it to you now you little boy little girl you tell me back what i just told you and then I tell you a verse and you need to memorize it, tell it back to me. I sing a song to you, you need to learn it, sing it back to me. I tell you a statement of faith, some kind of creed, you need to say it back to me as well. And I made the strong statement that kids should have a choice in that. That's part of thought autonomy. Kids can learn that stuff. I have no problem with kids learning everything you want about Christianity. I'm, I study Christianity more than I ever have. I'm in my Bible every day much more than I was as a Christian, much more, much, 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 and infinitely more. Um, I have no trouble with people learning about Christianity, reading their Bible at all. But the issue is forcing people saying you must and you will. 
And I made the statement, that's an issue of thought autonomy. We cannot force kids to do this stuff. And I mean to tell you the backlash was overwhelming. Of course they have to, you can't say that, this is horrible. They have to, they have to, no, they don't. Yes, they do, no, they don't, yes, they Guys, again, I've said this before, this is some sick and dark stuff. This is some really dark stuff. Forcing little children to repeat, which we know what repetition is about. That's about getting it into your psyche and your worldview to repeat back to you mythology. Force mytho mythological worldviews on children is sick. It's a psychological, it's a version of psychological child abuse. And it has to stop guys, it has to stop. I'm passionate about it and I will fight it tooth and nail. You cannot force children to believe something. Thought autonomy is just as important as bodily autonomy. Body autonomy. You you tell a kid, um, you know, you you don't have to give hugs to so and so. If we're at a party, and you want to give a hug to someone you know, but then someone else comes up that you don't really know, or you don't recognize, or remember, it's been a couple of years. You don't want to give a hug, then you don't have to give a hug. It's your body. You get to choose. Even for me as a parent, hey sweetie, it's bedtime. I'm tucking you in. Do you want a hug from daddy? Yes, sure. No, okay. It's your body, your choice. You don't want a hug, then you don't get a hug. That's fine. It's your body. Give them the power. Give them the autonomy. Give them the respect. But when it comes to thought autonomy, oh, hell no. They better say and believe what I think and believe. That's what Christians push. And this week, it came in like a flood. It was like someone just took a bat and bashed me over and over and over about this issue. And guys, it's just for those of you that are following my story at all, I know I don't talk about it too much, but my story is getting worse. It's getting worse. It's getting more, much more sad. It's getting much more painful. And I said at the beginning, I, I want this to be more about just sharing my story, but I do want to tell people who are at the very beginning, brace for impact. Christians by and large, I'm sure there's exceptions, but Christians by and large will treat you as a traitor as the enemy, and especially when there's children involved, you are a major threat. Brace for impact, this will not be an easy ride. And I'm case in point, every week gets more complicated and more difficult, more nasty, more poisonous in terms of what I experience as a result of this. It's hard stuff and it is dark. And you think these people are throwing away so much beauty over mythology from thousands of years ago and they'll do it too and that brings me to one of the thoughts i wanted to wrap up with and that is what this is all about what am i doing with my channel what am i doing with my life i hope to do it sometime full-time i don't have the financial backing at this point to even remotely consider it i'd love to someday i'm hoping that it's within a year or two um, i think within two years is probably pretty likely i'd love to say you know, Christmas of 2022, I'll be doing this full time. I'm backlogged with interviews. I was going to share that I'm, I'm, I'm almost backlogged a year. Like I've, I've almost got people booked up for a year in advance. Like I've got people almost this time next year booked up to do interviews with. That's crazy. And that's, that's leaving huge piles of other people that I want to reach out to that I know would love to do it, leaving them on the side. So that I could, if I could book everyone I wanted to, I could probably easily book three or four years in advance. I'm going to cut it to one. I'm not booking anybody in the past 12 months. That's crazy. Um, but my point is, this is getting bigger. This is not a little wave. This is a tsunami. Christians are leaving the church and the emotions behind this are real. The ostracization and the shunning, the backlash the punishment Christians want to punish you so bad. They'll deprive you of good things and they will actively punish you for leaving, for being a traitor to the cross of Christ. And I want to create a platform where people feel empowered to tell their stories when the time is right. If, and when the time is right, and they feel like they can share it even repeatedly, some people will be coming back a second time, you know, a year later to say, I want to tell where it's what's happened since I left, talk about it some more. 
but I want to create a platform beyond just the information. Obviously, the Enoch project and all that, it's huge in my heart. Y'all know that. But this is about emotions too. This is about people healing. This is about creating a way for people to process like what's happening. And one of the biggest ones I've, I've noticed in my own heart is the roots of, of Christianity go so deep. The issue of thinking of yourself as in shameful ways, the triggers that that brings up and the, the ways it's so hard to eradicate that. You think in terms of especially sexuality, you're trained so much to think of yourself in a shameful context. Your, your desires, your, your the power of sexuality in your life, uh, the beauty of it, you know, the, the interest in it. You, you have so many ways in which it's woven and you should be ashamed in many ways of what you're thinking and of what you want and of how powerful this is over your mind. And even still two years out, I still struggle with getting rid of those thoughts. And I, I feel like we need to be bringing these things to the forefront of people's minds. How do you help people to block out the Christian worldview as soon as you can, when you escape and to really heal from, to think through it, you know, to identify, you have to identify what's going on before you can block it. But to, as you identify it, as you dig up these things, as you reopen these old wounds to go in and try to heal them properly. And a lot of that for some people is obviously going to be professional, you know, with a, a trained psychiatrist, psychiatrist, psychologist, counselor, whatever, um, hopefully secular, but whatever, you know, other counseling you may need to go through just in, in, a, in the quietness of your own heart, as you ponder these things to think whatever time I've got left, whatever your, you know, your life expectancy is, whether it's a few years or a lot of years, I want to live my life in a way that is free of these old shackles. These shackles were not truth. They were utter lies, mythology through and through. And I want to live a different life now. I want to be free. I want to live in the light, the beauty, the absolute glory of what life actually is apart from this crazy uh, Greco-Roman mystery cult we call Christianity. People, people don't realize how deep some of these roots are. And some people do realize it and they just don't know how to get past it. Case in point, how do you move on past this stuff when it's, when you've had it for 43 years in your psyche, you can't just unravel it that quickly you can unravel your faith in the sense that you understand its mythology but you can't unravel all the ways that this is this has programmed you this is part of your deep programming to unprogram it to unlearn what you've learned takes a long time and i've got a strong passion to get the information out but also to talk about the healing stuff and i'm going to be doing a lot of stuff over the next hopefully six to 12 months, if not sooner, but a lot of stuff about sexuality that's become bigger and bigger in my heart. And um, again, for those of you who are about to tell the world you're out, uh, brace for impact, you, you are probably about to become very celibate, at least, you know, for, for the time being uh, until something changes and just brace for impact. This is going to be a crazy ride. And as people begin to escape, they need some they need, like, I see so many people going through on these channels where so many of these channels are saying, let's talk about the mythology only, or let's talk about um, how Christianity is so stupid. I get it. I, I get where people are coming from, but I think we need a, we need a balance. We need to talk, talk um, less about how Christians are stupid, even though that certainly is the worldview is stupid, but talk, you know, about Christians as people who are deceived and duped and that we were part of it and we're now out of it and that we want to uh, somewhat respectfully agree to disagree, but also to say, we're going to have a, have, a, have a fight in this. We're going to have a dog in this fight. We are going to change the world and we're going to make it better by helping to eradicate mythology from our, our collective worldview. And that's not going to happen if we're not healthy. People need to be able to thrive. And the thriving, in my opinion, is in, in many ways learning to just pull, pull and pull and pull these roots out. It's crazy to think about some of this stuff is going to take a lifetime, but if you are committed to it, life gets brighter and brighter and brighter. And you realize you were living in a dark cave all this time. And now you're finding the sunshine 
and you begin to, to see how your, your body is pulling you back in the cave. Like, let's go back to the shadows. Let's go back to the darkness. And you have to fight it actively. But eventually it gets real easy. You have absolutely no, you know, second nature of maybe we should pray now. Or, oh, no, I almost got hit by a car. Thank God we didn't get, you just, it just slowly fades. Your desire to, to pray or to sing songs to this demigod, your desire to, in any way, have a mythological worldview it, it sickens you to think about you think that was my old self i'm di i died to that self to borrow the christian terminology that part of me is gone and i'm sickened by that person kind of like if you were a man who was very misogynistic and you woke up and realized i was really really deeply wrong you you'd hope that kind of person would say i was you know this chauvinist you know uh, patriarchal guy that just mistreated women and now that I've woken up and realized what I was doing, I'm sick of my old self. That was horrible what I was, was like. That's what it's like with Christianity. I was horrible. I was horrible to other people, horrible to myself, horrible to cognitive dissonance issues. Just I was just so wrong, profoundly, utterly wrong. And now for the first time, my eyes are open and I'm going to start to do this right. It's going to take some time. I'm going to build slowly. I'm going to learn a lot. I'm going to get under some good people now, not Christians, but under good people who are willing to help me think carefully and clearly. And I'm going to build a foundation for the rest of my life that's actually worth living for. There's beauty in that, but it's a lot of hard work. And I want to do a lot to encourage people in how they do that. And I think, in my opinion, sexuality is probably one of the biggest ones out there. It's not the only one. Um, just even the whole idea of you, you're a sinner, you're shameful, whether it's about sex or not. Um, you know, God can see inside your head and your heart and you're bad, bad, bad. That alone is enough, but there's so many things to unwind and we're going to unwind them. We're going to unwind them carefully and as thoroughly as I can. And they're going to, everything is going to have an iteration. Any topic we talk about a year or two later, I'm going to bring it right back up again, but with a lot of feedback, a lot of thought, a lot of reflection, and hopefully the second time it'll be exponentially better. That's my goal for this channel. Um, that's what two years of being out of Bible prison does is it inspires you to grieve what you've lost, to grieve what you're currently losing because of the, the savagery of Christians as they attack you. Um, grieve it all, but give the next generation a fighting chance. Protect those kids. Protect those kids at all costs. Protect those kids at all costs. And Learn to delight, learn to delight in your life, in your thoughts, in your understanding of the world. You know, you're, you're basically coming to a point where you're, you're seeing the world so differently. You thought you understood what was going on in the world. It was a fight against good versus evil, God versus the devil, uh, angels versus demons, um, you know, the new us versus the old us and versus sin and worldliness. That was what used to be going on in the world in our minds. None of that's real. None of that was actually happening. It was just what we conceived of. Now you get the chance to say, let's, let's figure out what's actually happening in the world. We want to leave this world better than we found it. And to do that, we have to make cultural changes. We have to make changes that go all the way up into, even into politics. Um, this isn't a political platform, obviously, in any way, but we're going to talk about it from time to time about how do we change the political platform of this country, of the United States, uh, where we make it really difficult for people who believe in mythology to become major players. Uh, is that possible? How do we do it? That's in my heart so much. I'd love, love, love to see that, where people said, you know, like, if you're running as a candidate and you believe in Jesus, we know now it's, it's thoroughly been shown it's, it's just mythology. So you're equivalent to saying, I believe in Ra or Thor or Zeus or Dionysius, your chance of standing up and saying, I believe I wholeheartedly have given my life and my heart and my mind to Thor. Now let me be your Supreme Court justice. That kind of person, if they were taken seriously at face value, people would say, there's no way we're letting you in. You've given your life to Thor. What in the world are you talking about? We need that same exact thing to happen with the Jesus stories. He's a character in a story. 
and this mythology and, and this way that we've said, oh, if you believe in Jesus, that's probably a plus. You're probably more moral. Oh, it just sends shivers down my spine to think about. But we want to change the culture. That's my vision. That's my goal. Uh, this has just been kind of very few notes here, but just this is this is what's been in my heart. I hope it came through and made some sense. I hope it's been helpful. Um, either way, we got some good stuff coming, some very interesting interviews coming, and a lot of just normal average people that have power, powerful stories. There's power in your story, your story, not just the movers and shakers and the people that have you know 100,000 subscribers on YouTube or whatever. There's power in your story. There's power in your, in your sharing it and telling it. And someone needs to hear it. And so when the time's right, please do speak up and, and share it. That's my uh, word for the day. Uh, thank you so much for spending some time with me here. I hope it's been helpful and I look forward to the next two years. Let's see what we can do. Um, let's get it done. Let's get this thing moving. And uh, I guarantee you, if I ever get to do this full-time from home, I will crank up the efforts exponentially. I'll be doing more interviews, hopefully uh, double or triple the interviews and a lot more projects, a lot more monologues like this, hopefully much, much better. And uh, across the board, I want this to thrive partially because I want to do it full time. I want, I want this to be my life. I want this to be the biggest impact I have with the rest of my career, so to speak. But I want to impact people's lives. People are desperate for help. They're desperate for information. They're desperate, desperate for support. They're desperate for community. And I want to be one of the people that says, let's do it. Let's give it to people. Let's give them better than we found. We didn't find that much when we deconverted. It took us a lot of time, took us a lot of energy, and we found very little support up front. Let's exponentially increase this so the next generation finds this a much, much smoother process. Um, I love it. I love it. I love helping people. I love being able to have a, a bit of a vision, so to speak, for uh, what deconversion and deconstruction is going to look like for people and how to make it smoother in terms of um, this research. My heart is in this. I give it my every bit of energy. I know I look tired sometimes. There's good reasons for that. I'm often up late studying studying this stuff. Uh, but despite my fatigue, my heart is on fire. I'm passionate about helping people escape the Bible prison. And I appreciate your support in this. There's, there's many of you who support me, sending me emails. Uh, some of you are able to financially support me, but whatever level of support, I just appreciate that people are, are giving me a thumbs up and saying, yes, let's do this. Let's get this done move it forward, crank it up, make this platform bigger, get this information in people's hands as quick as you can, if not sooner. And uh, let's help people heal. And let's help people reclaim their identities outside of the Bible prison. So we're going to do it. We're going to do a really good job. And we're going to do a better job after that. It's going to just keep getting better. So thank you for your support. Thank you for your love. I feel it, feel it, feel it. And uh, looking forward to some good things ahead. Thanks again. Thank you.